Hey guys, it is your girl Natch here today. Um, I have got a zinger of a topic for you. Um, something that's very close to my heart about why I quit a bad boss um, and why I have an unpopular opinion of why you should just run for the hilt if you have a bad boss who you think might be a narcissist or um, I don't know, who might have a personality disorder, who you just think is corrupt, maybe you think they're incompetent to a very deep fault. Um, let's just say I was in my job, you know, with this bad boss for two years and it was a job that I loved. I wasn't with this particular boss for two years towards my last six months with the, with the organization this boss had come in and it was just really much a culture shock and not really a culture shock but a shock from the previous boss that I had had. Um, not a culture shock, I didn't mean to say that. Um, but just the difference of these two women's personalities um, was just a big shock and I want to discuss sort of my delving into research on YouTube, on Reddit, on Quora, you know, to see um, and to please tell me if I'm pronouncing that website right. Like, I never know if I'm saying that right. Quira, Quira. Um, but sort of my journey into delving into, you know, online to see, hey, like, should I leave? Should I stay? Should I go? I'm going to tell you guys my opinion. Uh, I still, if I could go back in time, I would do the same thing. So I leave it to my followers and viewers' discretion to choose your path. But ultimately, I think what it comes back to when you've got a bad boss, who you really think, and, and I'm not just talking about, oh, they, um, you know, missed one team meeting one day or, um, one day they, they were having a bad day because their kid was sick and they were a little bit grumpy. That's not the type of thing that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a really, really bad boss where there's questions of your integrity, of your um, of mental well-being, of your physical well-being at hand. I'm talking about that type of situation. So um, I think you should take that as a caveat and as a um, trigger warning. Um... There's also this thing in here about, you know, did my boss hate me because she thought I was pretty or because I'm pretty or because she thought I was pretty? Um, this is just something I've discussed with my friends, with my husband, with, you know, my family afterwards. Just, you know, kind of venting, kind of pinpointing why this woman really just seemed to want to totally annihilate me and get rid of me. Um, and it was something that came up and, you know, there's this thing out sort of in the world, on the internet, uh, about women pitting each other, uh, pitting each other against each other in the, uh, in the workplace. That doesn't even sound right, does that? Pitting each other against each other. <laughs> um, but just this idea that there's this adversarial uh, relationship between women sometimes within the workplace that gets competitive, um, where people throw each other under the bus, where someone's trying to get rid of each other, you know, whatever that might be. Um, so we're going to discuss all of that and I'm going to kind of tell you about my journey to my decision to just quit um, and take a stance and stand up for my mental, physical well-being, stand up for um, my morals, what I believe in, and myself as a professional, you know, to maintain some sense of integrity when people are clearly putting you out into a light that you are not. Um, so if you're on this video, if you're watching this video, um, let's just say we know that there's a reason why you're here. Like-minded energies, they, they, they tend to flock to one another like magnets. So if you're here, I'm so thankful that you're here and there's a reason that you're here. There's a reason for all the struggles that we go through and we're going to make it. <laughs> okay, so let's dive right into this. So the reason why I left uh, my job of two years, so a friend had gotten me this job, my yoga instructor, um, and ten, a friend of 10 years. She's about 30 or 40 years older than me, so this is a friendship that is personal. You know, it crosses the lines of, you know, mentorship, friendship, you know, just girlfriends gabbing together, uh, a motherly type thing, a sisterly type thing. So um, there's various levels of that, and she had a high sort of place within this organization. 
Um, so she initially got me the job and when she got me the job, before the boss, the bad boss, there was a very good boss um, and we got along great. So basically, you know, if you don't know what I do is marketing um, and I'm uh, within the senior level of my domain. Um, and so I was actually getting my master's at the time that my friend approached me about this job. Um, and I had another contract had just ended and we had spoken about this and she was like, oh, well, hey, the organization that I'm aboard for, they're actually looking for a little bit of marketing help. Uh, would there be any chance you want to pitch in? Like, I know I won't be able to pay you exactly, you know, what you deserve because we're a small nonprofit. Um, but I, I would love for you to just meet, you know, this boss, our executive director, this is the good boss, um, and just, you know, get your thoughts on it and maybe you want to join us on a part-time contract basis. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. So, pause there. Jump back in time, basically, to why it is back in 2016 that I started freelancing in the first place. And I know, I, I you know, this is going to be a, a bit of a story, but I got to get to you to the point of why this was something that was so important and deep and profound for me. So back in 2016, I had just gotten out of a portfolio school, a really well-known advertising portfolio school in San Francisco, but they have campuses all over the world. And you get to work with, you know, creative directors who have worked on brands all over the world, really renowned within the advertising and marketing industry. Um, and I got a job like immediately, you know, like I had had a stable, um, you know, two year job at an in-house place uh, that worked across three sectors like alimentation and, and um, I'm sorry, restaurantation and radio. And uh, basically I was on a team of two with myself and the marketing manager. And then after that, I decided I wanted to go more into the agency route. And so I went to San Francisco, went to portfolio school, got a job at a high, high, you know, top dog agency right off the bat, like within a year. So I actually left portfolio school to just go ahead and do the job. I'm like, you know, it's no, no use staying here. Like, you know, I, I'm having a job that's paying well. They see that I already have experience. They see that I've gotten a certain place in my career. So um, it was very easy for me to transition from brand side to agency side. So um, I'm at this agency. Things are going great. And, you know, I'm the only black female creative within the creative department you know which is made up of probably 10 to 20 people um when you include the developers you know editors copywriters offshore designers things like that all together is about you know 20 people but just in the office there's probably about 10 or 12 people you know and um i'm the only black female uh, creative and there's only one other black female in the office and so these conversations about race are uncomfortable and I get it but it's a part of the whole grand scheme of things you know in the video that I talked about about Harry and Meghan if you haven't seen that check that out um, I discussed sort of institutional racism and how it's it's not a conversation that anyone wants to have I don't think unless you just really are at the core a very mean mean prejudiced person unless you you know if you really are a mean mean prejudiced person these conversations you just live for them you know you just want to bash somebody down but I think for the most of us we're good people at heart and we're living in a changing cultural landscape and we're just having these new conversations about how to move forward how to progress and I think part of that requires that you be extremely open-minded, op open-minded, open-minded, and extremely patient. Um, so I don't, I don't just throw out, oh, you know, this happened to me, systemic racism, you know, uh, I, I got discriminated against because I'm black because I want to whine. I speak on these things because they are the truth. And as someone who has a background in education where I'm very, very used to being the, the, the quote unquote token, um, I, this is not my first rodeo, you know. So I'm at this office, you know, grade A, like I said, top dog advertising agency. And my manager, you know, and I know, especially, you know, from re reviews and references and testimonials that I've gotten from 
clients, from bosses, from co-workers, and just knowing myself, I know that I put in 160% into what I do, you know, and I don't just speak out of the side of my mouth. I back it up with research. I back it up with experience. Um, I'm not the type of person that just goes, goes flying off about stuff that I don't know about. Um, second thing is respect. I come from a working class background. You know, my dad was a painter and my mom is a teacher. Um, she's a retired teacher now. Um, I come from a very middle class, just working class background. And so respect is another thing for me. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from. I try to show you a level of respect and kindness. And I just hope that I will get shown the same thing in, in return. Of course, that doesn't always happen. So I'm at this agency. I know that I'm surrounded by, you know, an agency. Maybe you've never been in one, but, you know, people are playing video games. They're, you know, having a beer at the office even. They're rolling around on hoverboards and skateboards in the office. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes it can feel like a big frat party. Um, and it's a very male-dominated industry, honestly, if we have to be honest, and very uh, white male-dominated. You know, the majority, the bulk of my co-workers were, in fact, white. And, you know, that's okay, but let's try to get the dynamics as a general, you know, in, in the G7 countries in our workplaces, representing what the populations are in those countries. That's all that I think people are, are, are asking for, is a little bit more representation. And people who are like, oh, well, you know, no, not, not everybody who's within these racial minority groups are actually um, qualified for the job. You know, I think that's hoo-ha. You know, there's plenty of educated, really talented people out there that are representative of more what the cultural landscape in different countries look like. So America is definitely no exception. And I was in San Francisco at this point. I live in France now. Um, and that was the case. And so I know that I'm putting in 120 percent. I'm listening very closely to things to do. I'm getting mentorship from the, the creative directors. I don't claim to know everything, but I'm soaking everything in like a sponge while asserting what I know to be experience and talent within my domain. And I'm confident with that. Um, but at the same time, I'm kind, you know, and I like to joke around. Everybody in the agency likes to joke around. And I joke around right with them. Um, but I notice, you know, my level of confidence, my level of experience, my level of education sometimes gets misconstrued as an angry black woman type thing. You know, I even had a boss there who said, Oof, I'm scared of you. And I sort of just chuckled it off at that point, you know, and kind of laughed at it. It was like, oh, <laughs> but then I thought about it later. And I really think that this is a thing, you know, sometimes when you have a black woman who just you know, it's like one of the guys can laugh with you, can assert herself. I think that can be quite jarring for some people. And it's just like, dude, this is 2023, you know, 2022. What, what, why? Yeah, anyway. So it starts with a manager here at this company who just everything that I do, it seems like it's, it's not good enough. And he's, I don't know, he's a tall, skinny Jewish man. And it just seems like he's, intimidated by me he's treating me like I'm trying to come after his job or something and I'm not I'm just like the same things that I say that one of the guys would say it's like it gets misconstrued and I get labeled into this aggressive black woman territory and I'm like if somebody else would have said that nobody would have blinked an eye and then skip towards to HR contacting me and just saying things like hey we wanted to just talk to you um like there were there were some concerns that you weren't reading emails uh, completely and things like that. And I'm just like, hmm, who is saying that? What is that? And it just slowly builds up over this. And then I'm going to tell you what broke the camel's back of letting me know that I didn't want to be in this corporate structure that really hasn't progressed to the point where it needs to be culturally yet, you know, like diverse, like relate in relation to diversity in relation to um, sort of tolerance and sort of respecting people's different personalities and trying to use their traits as um, as advantages and benefits. Um, right while this was all building up, I had been at the agency for about a year and a half. Um, I actually got assaulted on a streetcar there, and you know, th there's also this this societal thing that was in San Francisco. I was here making lots of money within this culture of just wealth and extravagance and elegance and, um, you know, there's the contrast of the homelessness and the, the, 
the poverty and these um, children who are being pulled into violent gangs and, and you know, there, there's these two sides and I'm, you know, I'm, I grew up in Atlanta and you do have these things in Atlanta, but um, just seeing it there, it kind of broke my heart a little bit. And so I'm, I'm there in San Francisco at this job for about a year and a half. I get assaulted on a streetcar for defending a woman, an older lady, um, and these kids, you know, basically 14, 15, 16 year olds just kicked my butt um, for speaking up. And I don't think I would go back and change it, but um, that was really a defining moment for me where I was like, okay, I'm looking at American politics. I look on the TV, it's a circus. I look out in the streets, it's a circus. I just had my physical well-being, uh, you know, intruded. It's a circus, you know, and on top of this, I'm making this good money. I'm at this ad agency, but I'm still just the token. I'm still just not really being paid the the due that I'm that I deserve, you know, as far as, you know, you did a great job. Next time, let's try and see what we can do here. You know, it's like I'm being picked apart in comparison to my peers who are at the same place within their within their level, within their field, and it's not fair. It's injustice. So I'm like, you know what? I know that I'm good at what I do and I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to still get uh, top name clients. I'm still going to go out and actually I'm like, you know what? This is an opportunity for me to bring what I've been gaining from top dog clients to give it back to the smaller businesses and uh, the, the entrepreneurs and the artists, which is one of my big passions. So I was like, you know what? I'm done with America. I'm done with, you know, this this token type thing. I'm done with not being given my due as, you know, uh, someone in my field. I'm not, I'm not asking for like an overly huge expression of gratitude or whatever it might be. No, I'm just asking for my fair due. Um, so I decide to start freelancing and it kicks off. I'm making just as much money as I did when I was in house, but I have more flexibility. I can travel and it's really interesting. Like I'm not just hot log. I'm not, uh, bolted down to one type of client, one, one client, one brand. I'm like having fun experiencing something that is bigger than that. And so, um, I go and I backpack around Europe for about uh, two months, six weeks, something like that. Um, and I go to London, I go to Paris, I go to Amsterdam, I go to Rome, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. And I basically am just trying to, and I, there's other little places throughout there, you know, just in transit, like, you know, I went through Spain, went through Belgium, whatever. But I basically just went to those major places and was like, I want to build uh, my life here. I was like, I like it so much better here. And the place that real, well, the two places that really intrigued me were London and Paris. So for like six months, I was going back and forth to London. Again, still freelancing, still working, like making good money, working with good clients, but still I don't have to get caught into this sharky, nasty um, office culture type thing. And I'm moving up within my, my status, within my field, you know, going from an associate to mid-level to, you know, junior to senior, whatever it is, I'm also following that track while still having the flexibility to travel and kind of figure out where I'm going to move, where I'm going to land. So, um, London doesn't work out. People are too cold. <laughs> Even though we speak the same language, just, uh, when I got to Paris, people were just so warm the food was so delicious and the language was so beautiful oh my god the art and the castles i'm a huge art history buff and freak i just fell in love with paris and i am still in love with it even though my husband doesn't want to live here anymore he wants to go back to portugal but either way um i fell in love with paris so this is about um 2017 and i'm going back and forth to paris from the uh atlanta to paris I'll, I'll go to Atlanta or Los Angeles, wherever, honestly, I have a contract, Chicago. I'll stay for three months, I'll work, and I'll go back to Paris. Sometimes I have French clients, sometimes I have American clients, but I'm just basically owning this, this empowerment that I've taken. So, flash forward, 
um, to going back and forth to Paris, you know, and I started going to a linguistic school to start learning French. Did that for about two and a half, three years. Um, flash forward to 2020, and I've started my master's in 2019. I decided, oh, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a master's in marketing. And okay, so while I'm at this university in Paris, I'm pursuing my master's, and uh, this is when I get the call from my friend who says, you know, and my contract is ending, so it comes at perfect timing. And I'm like, oh, this is great. So this is for a small nonprofit. Uh, it's for an advocacy agency out of my hometown. Well, not my hometown, where I grew up, out of Atlanta. Um, and they advocate for children's rights, and it's a multi-faith sort of nonprofit organization for uh, advocating for children. I'm like, that's great, you know, like especially on my journey at this point over the past, you see my first job I got in 2014 out of school. Um, I had started with internships and jobs before that, so this is at this point, you know, I've been working in my career for like eight or nine years. And, you know, based upon what I just told you on my journey, this is like amazing because it's one of those clients where I am getting to feel fulfilled, you know, and it's working towards a cause. And when I come into this organization, I just know, you know, everyone is so welcoming and kind um, but also very very talented in each of their respective roles and very passionate to do their best at these respective roles because they know it's for ultimate cause they know if I do this we'll raise money so that kids uh, you know in this particular district will be able to afford this this year or if we do this 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 policy might get passed like it's like I'm I'm home. I feel like I have arrived home and it's warm and it's lovely. Um, this is where we're under the reign of the good boss. <laughs> so there's an executive director and she is just lovely. She's one of the type of people who's um, very humble, you know, but at the same time, very, very experienced. You can tell their experience. They don't have to completely brag about it or boast about it because you see that they've done this they they like also have a leadership style that is close and personal but not uh intimidating or aggressive not um uh something that's unexpected is very reliable um but at all at the same time under a, a wing of leadership that's very understanding and aside of that i have my friend here who you know even though she's you know three, four decades older than me and our degrees in marketing are, you know, that much apart. She also has a background in marketing. So it's an opportunity for me to work with my friend and, um, and it's just amazing. So things are happening, you know, and I'm bringing experience to this small organization that, you know, and, and not in an offensive way, but that they have no idea that they even needed to have these type of capabilities like you know a functioning CRM you know and I don't expect you guys to understand what all of this stuff means but basically having marketing that's not just there just to be there and not just you know winging it every couple of months with an email here and there you know but really activating and engaging their audiences on their website on social media um, developing strategy this 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 the marketing of this organization when I came in was really lacking in strategy um, updating their logo like my handprints are all over this and so is the good bosses um, and at about at, I'd say three or four months in uh, a team member was hired to be my partner and she was sort of advocacy outreach and a writer you know so she 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 had a background as a lawyer she's a bell I love her um, I had a video call with her last week um, she she has a lot of experience within the legal space and so she is actually trying to do activities around promoting certain policies and we can actually communicate about that in our channels and in return donors actually want to engage with us 
because they see the work being done and so they're willing to give money um i have actual money coming in on a normal basis you know like a continual revenue stream even though it's less money but donors who are giving on a steady basis as well as raising money and hitting goals for fundraisers and i can't claim all of that responsibility or that for myself it really took us as a whole team but um let's just say marketing really pay, played an instrumental role um, and some of the successes that that organization had had over those two years, and I played an instrumental role in marketing. Um, so, I'm there. Things are going great. It's 2020, and in the summer of 2020, there is an event coming up, an event that they've had every year, big benefit uh, for 20 years. And this year's when COVID hit, so it needs to be digital. And so, my friend comes to me and she says, hey, well, we have a board member. Um, and let me just caveat this before we're going into this board thing. So something that the executive director and that my new partner, the advocacy outreach partner had noticed is that this organization is comprised of like 15 board members and three staff members. And the board is constantly sort of micromanaging and just nitpicking and you know, like sort of hovering over the staff, you know, but it's not direct. It's always indirect. It's, it's sort of just like very big brotherish. Um, and we don't really say too much because, hey, this is the way this organization has worked for a really long time. They've worked on the basis of volunteers and they're starting to finally get a little bit more legitimate in terms of their operations, in terms of their staffing. So we're patient with them, but at the same time, we're like, um, there needs to be a little bit more structure here. And there needs to be a little bit more trust, it seems, between the staff and the board. And, you know, honestly, from an organizational standpoint, the board really shouldn't be so involved in everyday, you know, ins and outs of, you know, what the staff's is um tasks are you know like marketing and social media that, that's just like i've never ever been with a brand and you know the executive leadership board needs to approve you know a facebook post or something like that you know it's like it was micromanaging to the next level but at the same time we got it because it's a small organization and so it's like all hands just have to go in and so we start noticing things, my partner and I, over time, that our boss, the good boss, the executive director, just seems really, really on a tight, in a tight, 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 tight clasp from the board. And we're just like, what's going on? So that's sort of the, the actuality that goes over the course. Flashback to August in 2020. So my, my, my friend says, hey, there's a board member, and she... um. She does production design and film. Her background is in film. And since the event this year is going to be digital um, or virtual, you guys can collaborate together to produce some commercials and things and promotional type things for the event to, to go across digital media. And you guys can also collaborate on uh, some production of the actual event itself. You know, and putting a nice look and feel, some colors, some lower thirds, advertising, some things like that. I'm like, great, that's great. Now, again, <laughs> remind you of my career and where I've come from. At this point, I'm at a senior level, okay? And I've been doing what I've been doing for almost a decade. And I've reached a certain level within my field, okay? I'm on a senior level. Um... And so I'm an art director, and at this point, my capacity is basically art director, creative director, marketing manager. I mean, I'm wearing 18 different hats because there's only three employees. And so, um, oh, I lost my, my train of thought. <laughs> anyway, so basically, I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff. And in the past, I have had to manage offshore designers. I've had to um, oversight developers and animators to say, oh, could you change this? Could you make this transition faster? Could you do this? Could you do that? Just so it looks like what's been defined in our, you know, 
creative campaign or within our brand guidelines. Again, I know I'm throwing some of these terms out a little liberally, um, but basically I'm doing my job. <laughs> and uh, from the very beginning, when I would, you know, I'm, I'm giving her basically the way a campaign works, if you don't know, is that, you know, uh, usually a writer, uh, a, a art director, a creative director and a, a strategist come together or just one marketing representative person they come together to find a strategy to find an overall theme an idea for a campaign or project then you define uh, the tone of that as far as the writing and define the design define what it looks like um, and an art director in my capacity usually if there are people who are taking your designs basically and doing other things with them such as turning them into an app, animating them, you know, uh, trafficking them on a website, like uh, animating it into a commercial, whatever. You basically oversight them to make sure that they really grasp what the vision is that's been approved. And so from the beginning, when she comes in and I give her these, these the feedback on her animations and things like that, I sense a little like pushback immediately. And I, I dismiss it as nothing because it's so subtle and it's so kind of like she's being very, very nice. But at the same time, I'm like, there's something there. Something's going on. Like, this, this is going to be a problem later. And it was a problem later. <laughs> um, so we go through a year of that. And then I don't really hear or see from her much again. Sometimes it seems like the board tries to interject her into... Some of our normal, you know, week to week, day to day operations, the marketing team, which is basically again comprised of myself, the writer slash advocacy outreach person and the executive director. And sometimes my friend would be in on those calls, you know, who is the board, the board chair. And as I'm going into the organization and getting to know it more, my friend has quite a lot of hold. OK, so I, I'm realizing that the board is really who's in charge. It's not the executive director. You know, it's not the staff who is, you know, setting forth. Here's what our needs are. How can you as an organization help us move forward? It's like, no, the board, this this organization revolves around what the board wants. You know, and it gets very uncomfortable at a certain point. Um, but my friend behaves as normal, you know, outside of work, you know, asking me if we're looking for a new house, like, you know, did we get a dog yet? How's everything going? It's like, you know, normal stuff. But then um, things are happening in the background that I don't really see. And so it manifests itself in a different way. So... This goes on for a while. We do another event, virtual again, you know, still as COVID rolls on in 2021. And I have to work with uh, who I don't know is going to become my future bad boss, you know. And again, and I'm sensing the same pushback, only this time she has gotten COVID herself. And she's, you know, the previous year working with her before, um, we didn't get some some of the files that we needed for this event until the day of the event and um she just seemed like the type of person who was a little nutty you know a little quirky and so I was like oh okay I just made concessions for it but honestly in my background if there's a deadline you you have to meet that deadline and there's no um flexibility around that so I was kind of surprised at how lax you know the organization took it I'm like this is a fundraiser so people should be getting what they're paying for. Otherwise, why are we talking about all of this, you know, customer relationship stuff if we're just going to go and gash it all up? And then the next year she gets COVID and it's like she's holding the files hostage. And, you know, I'm like, they're like, maybe we should just uh, postpone the event. I'm like, guys, we can just hire a, a, a freelance designer, throw them, you know, couple 300 200 or 300 bucks to to animate this stuff it's not that big of a deal and it's not that big of a loss put up against what will fundraise so finally i talked to some of my industry contacts and i get my old professor who is far more advanced in his career in film and in editing and motion media than the bad boss is and the bad boss is sort of again kind of subtly treating him like he's the employee kind of like she did with me 
And I'm just like, what is this? And at this point, she's not the executive director. She's a board member. So um, time goes on. And in 2021, late 2021, early 2020, um, early 2022, we just, me and my coworker, my partner, it's like we slowly see the deterioration of our boss. She just looks so absolutely um, crushed, you know, and it's like this board is holding her hostage and she doesn't have any real power. During the meetings, she's getting cut off, you know, whatever it might be. And I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'm remote, you know, during this whole time, I'm working remotely. As a freelancer, I work remotely. Um, and all of a sudden in February, you know, she just quits. She sends in her uh, resignation letter, and everybody's really surprised. And, uh, you know, my friend comes to me, and she's like, oh, well, we had a great idea of who to replace for executive director, and who do you know? It's future bad boss. It's the one who has a problem with me. And I'm just going to say, from the very beginning, you know, two years ahead of time, I always sense something adversarial and not right with this woman's interactions with me. I, I always, from the beginning, felt like something was off. And now, in hindsight, I can see that I think she was just really trying to get rid of me. And she did not like me. Um, and so, I'm speaking to my friend. She's my friend. And this woman is someone she's been a board member alongside for a very long time. So, of course, the fake smile passes on. I'm like, oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> But all the while knowing, uh, I feel like this is a problem. So my partner decides to leave, even though this new boss is coming in. You know, she's asked to stay, but she's like, no, she decides to go. And I don't talk to her for a very long time until I chatted with her last week. And the bad boss, let's just say uh, all of the stuff, let's just put it out there. Okay. So from the very beginning, it didn't seem like she was interested in connecting with me as a person, like the, the previous boss. Um, it seemed like there was an unspoken tension between us. She's uh, probably about 40. She's probably about 5 or 10 years older than me. She's darker toned, heavier set, and um, very smiley. And sometimes when people are very, very, I'm very smiley too, but... Um, you know, sometimes it can come across as fake. And she was the type of person who seemed to have a smile on her face, but had other ulterior and maybe not as nice motives behind the smile. And just something was always off with me with her. And so basically, long story short, over the six months that she is executive director, I'm working my butt off more than I ever did before for the organization, and it's not going anywhere. She needs to approve every single minute detail of anything, which it was not like with the previous boss. She really gave us the reins and the trust to run the marketing, and it was successful. Um, under her, you know, everything needs to come to her to approval. She's changing things that make no strategic sense from a marketing standpoint. And there is the elephant of the room where we know that she doesn't have any experience as an executive director. She doesn't have any experience. Her background is in production design and film. Um, so it's, it's very strange. And it kind of comes, she kind of comes in with the vibe of like, you need to respect me and try to kiss my butt and get on my good side because I'm the new boss in here, you know. And as I said, experience and talent and competence it speaks for itself. It doesn't have to be loud. And so that is one of the first things that just points out that someone doesn't know what they're doing. Um, she doesn't have any experience as far as marketing on a large scale for an organization that I know. Maybe she's designed a little flyer here and there for a church organization or done this, done that. Um, and the major way that lets me know that is after I quit, like, she actually texted me asking if the company had Hootsuite, which Hootsuite is a highly outdated tool that nobody who is a real marketer even uses. 
you go native. You use each individual platform native so that you can benefit from the analytical and strategic tools of each of them have to offer. You know, I didn't even have to go into that, but it was a lot of things that added up like that, that showed that she didn't know what she was doing in terms of marketing, but yet she was still trying to puff her chest up and kind of come in like throwing the reins like I'm the big boss, you know, from just basic simple stuff like key performance indicators and, you know, strategy behind things like CTAs and uh, headlines. It's like you can clearly tell this woman, yeah, I mean, I have 10 years of experience with this. So um, anyway. Beyond that, it just seems like she, she hires her friend to come in and be a copywriter. And, you know, my writing partner before is an actual lawyer. You know, she actually, like, really knows about the policies, the advocacy, the things that we're working on so she can create programs that really make sense for us to market. The person that she hires is just a friend, and it basically seems like she's there just because she's a friend. Um... And she's got the same kind of vibe going on. I know that I, I have way more experience in marketing. You know, I don't know about their experiences with film production or writing. But as far as marketing, I know that I have more experience with this. Moving on. Um, I don't want to sound like a mean girl and that can be counterproductive. But it's very, very frustrating when, as I said, my top tenets are I know the experience that I bring. I know that I'm always respectful and I try my best to be kind. Um, and slowly, my friend just gets pulled out of the situation when this bad boss comes in. So it's like I'm getting isolated, ganged up on, and it's all so subtle and understated that it's bizarre. And it ticks away, ticks away, ticks away, ticks away, ticks away, ticks away, ticks away until obviously I don't know what's going on and I go to my friend um, and I also go to a board member who's also been a mentor at this point, and I send him uh, 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 some thoughts, not necessarily a formal um, complaint, but some thoughts about how I feel I'm not receiving the information that I really need to do my job and perform sufficiently. Um, I feel micromanaged because all of the, you know, like, for example, our email communications and social media website communications that would go out on a weekly basis and we would have approved by the end of the week, you know, they're taking a month, they're taking five weeks, they're taking six weeks to go out and it looks bad on me, but it's actually bad boss. It's like she is actively making me look bad so that I guess when she can get rid of me, she can say, oh, I had a good reason. Um, and she's actively picking at me, nitpicking, nitpicking, nitpicking and ganging up on me or in her definition, ganging up on me with her friend uh, her Tweedledee, Tweedledum friend, and that's not nice. <laughs> um, and so they have a good reason to, you know, say, when I finally do just say, what the heck is going on, they, they have a chance to say that I'm insubordinate, which is what she said. Um, I'm the last thing from insubordinate. Very respectful, very kind. Um, so... <laughs> Basically, I have a meeting with my friend and the other board member who I mentioned is more like a mentor type thing. And they're like, oh, we're going to speak to her. Like, we're going to see what we can do. You've done great. You've contributed so much to the organization. I'm like, great. Okay. So I asked Bad Boss for a meeting with herself, the mentor, and my friend. And I send her a full complaint, a full formal complaint of everything that I've documented over the past six months that I have been unsatisfied with. And her response is simply, oh, well, you have a lot on your mind. This is the email that she sent me. Oh, well, you have a lot on your mind. So if you were a boss who was empathetic and so kind of secure about your job, secure about what you bring to the table, you would think you would say something more along the line, and someone who has had to sit through a trillion soft skills um, retreats and soft skills classes and PowerPoint presentations about HR, um, I think I would have had it drilled into my head about some sense of diplomacy and leadership that a leader should hold. Um, usually it doesn't include snarky emails with stuff like, oh, well, you have a lot in your mind. And beyond that, she does not approve, approve 
to have the other two board members in this meeting. She wants to, again, isolate me so that no one else gets a look into her disgusting behavior. Um, and so I say, I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm sorry. I'm not comfortable having a meeting with you by myself because I truly do not feel like my best interests are at heart and I have to think about my mental and physical, uh, my mental well-being. My well-being, basically. Um, and she says, oh, well, that's very unfortunate. So after a while, you know, she, f she finally agrees, oh, I'll have a meeting with you, but it's only going to be with the mentor type board member, not with your friend and myself, you know. And during this meeting, for the first 30 minutes, I'm not allowed to talk. Like I'm in kindergarten. Someone who has a decade of experience, someone who has given a whole lot to this organization, a whole lot, um, barely at the price that I deserve to be paid, at the, the, the salary that I deserve to be paid. Yeah, I'm basically someone who is um, doing a thankless job at this point, and it's a very hard job in this thankless. And on top of that, you have someone actively being nasty to get you out. Now, for me to comment on what this is, I don't know. I, I threw out the thing about, you know, maybe some sort of jealousy aspect being there before. I had just remembered one thing that stuck out to me one time, you know, with the previous boss, with a good boss. Um, beyond work, we could also just connect on a human level. I had remembered, um, I went through a terrible breakup with this guy, this guy who was absolutely bonkers. And he sent me an email as if he was his mother and said that he had committed suicide and said that it was my fault. That's a whole nother video in itself. Anyway, let's just say I got out of that real quick. Um, and my boss had called me one day and she happened to catch me right after I had read that email. So obviously, you can predict that I was like bawling my eyes out. I was screaming like, oh my God, I had to get to the hospital. Ah, ah. All the while, no, this guy is actually alive. It was just like a move from a crazy bipolar narcissistic dude doing some crazy stuff. Um, but she was there for me and she gave me some words of encouragement that I will never, ever forget. And that was that moment where she showed I can be more than just a boss to you. I can also just be there for you, you know, and I can listen and be there as a human being. And I got the same thing from her. She had had some health problems and some deaths in her family. And I really felt like I could just talk to her about it and check in on her. You know, we could also joke and laugh. We talk about new recipes. We're both trying to follow this diet, um, these new diets. So we talk about healthy recipes, you know, it was a thing of where she was actively trying to build a relationship with her employees, not just put, break them down like this woman was trying to do to me. And I'll never forget, I was talking to Bad Boss one day, and um, this was before my husband and I got married. And as you can imagine, you know, during this two years that I've been with this organization, I had seen the contrast of this guy who was absolutely insane, totally not good for me, totally took advantage of me. And then I finally met my husband and he was just the ultimate contrast to him. He just came in like, you know, a whirlwind and swept me off my feet and treated me the way that I deserve to be treated. Um, and I just remember I was on a call with her one day and we were talking about something. I don't remember exactly what the reference was. Maybe it was a TV show or maybe we were talking about something that happened with a celebrity. Um, and it was somehow related to being single and dating and stuff like that. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm so glad I don't have to deal with that stuff anymore. And she said like, oh yeah, me too. <laughs> know like what the poop face was for but it was one of those things where like the thing that someone says didn't match the expression on their face she's like yeah me too and I don't know if it was a jealousy thing like 
when I would just mention my husband, you know, at this time he was not my husband. When I would mention, you know, that oh, my, my partner and I were gonna we're starting a business or we're going on a vacation or whatever, just simple things. It just seemed like she saw me as some sort of weird competition, and I'm just like, what the heck is going on here? So during this meeting where she's basically telling me I'm insubordinate, you know, I'm not as far advanced in my career or as good as I think that I am. Um, and the, my mentor who's been there, he's just sitting there not saying anything. It's the most bizarre thing in the world. And by the end of this conversation, I say, hmm, okay, you know what? I don't think that I can work with you. I'm sorry. I just, I can't. And um, she's like, oh, that's really unfortunate. I'm really disappointed. And, you know, again, that thing where, like, the things that you're saying doesn't match the expression on your face. I can tell you at that moment, inside, she was probably like, go! <laughs> like, screaming so happy on the inside. Because from the beginning, her goal was to get me out. Um, I left. I left all of my materials with them. I organized all my files, um in a tedious, organized way like I am, so everything would have been clear. Um, I gave them access to my emails, everything, and I just was like, peace out. And the friendship with my friend, I kinda have, what's the best way to say this? I've kind of taken a step back from that friendship a bit because um, in my eyes, that's a huge, huge, huge betrayal because she knows, my friend I mean, how much work I put in over the two years, not being paid what I deserve because I was really passionate about it and because I really admired these people I worked with. And she knows that they made a, probably a bad decision hiring someone who has no experience and who is showing their true colors. So it might not have gotten to the place of where it really needs to be to expose what needs to be done and what mistakes we made, what we could have done better, if that's probably not going to come for a while. Because obviously this organization has a lot of pride because this has happened a lot of times before where they've lost good people because of basically what seems like, I don't like him, I don't like her. Um, and then after that, you know, the bad boss, a couple of times she messaged me, she emailed me, basically trying to get free work out of me, basically trying to get free advice. And when I talked to my old partner, she said, oh yeah, she did the same thing to me. But, you know, I'm like, I handed over my files. We're going to do a meeting next year and she's going to ask me if I want to come back and I'm going to say no. So clearly it's not just me who's been left with a bad taste in their mouth. And um, I don't respond to those messages. I'm like, hey, you didn't take advantage of me when you had the chance. And instead of you being a bigger person and not so damn insecure and coming in here and saying, Najwa, we are so, so, so thankful for you. You have done so much for us. Thank you. And I really want to take this new step forward. You know, I know that you had a close relationship with the previous boss. I think that we can also have a close relationship and I would like to give you your fair due. And even if that fair due wasn't an increase in my pay, which I was okay with, again, I wasn't doing this for the money. I, I had another client, you know, I was doing this because I really, really enjoyed the work. So even if they would have came and said, or she rather, even if she would have came and said, we are so thankful for everything that you've done for us, you know, and even though I cannot give you a pay raise yet, uh, we want to promote you to uh, marketing director or marketing manager or, uh, you know, senior, senior marketing liaison, whatever that might be. Because after she got rid of me, she brought in two more of her friends. And then after this, she brought in three, uh, what, what did they call it? Something like policy liaisons or something like you know, basically trying to replace the partner that I had before. And okay, maybe in a way that they're trying to take a stride forward, but basically when you go on their website, when you go on their social media, when you just look at the activities that they've done, when you go on their YouTube, when you look at their brand strategy, you look at their uh, approach to things, my hand prints are all over it. And 
they've hired a bunch of people and I know for a fact that none of these people have real experience with large scale brand strategy. So that's probably why uh, the fundraiser that they just had that ended like three weeks ago and was trying to raise twenty five thousand uh, dollars. I checked, you know, three weeks ago and it had raised, I think, one hundred and forty three. And then I checked, uh, I think last week or this week, and it was 2000 and something. Um, the, the, the social media is just struggling. And I look at their communications and it's just, it wasn't made thinking about mobile first. It's all over the place. You can clearly tell across the channels that this terrible Hootsuite contraption is probably what's being used. Everything just looks regurgitated out. You know, there's... It's clearly being ran by people who don't have as much experience as me, and that's okay. Um, but it's all very, very unfortunate. And I do feel deeply that I've lost a friendship because how can my friendship ever go back with my friend when she didn't fight for me, you know? And when she basically just drove a bunch of people out now that I'm seeing or was, you know, working in capacity to drive all of these people out. So how could I possibly look at her in the same way? Um, she even told me, she, she recommended me to go buy an anger management book. Gaslighting, you know, like I've never been so gaslit in my life. You know, I, I, I can't even describe it. And so now I want to talk a little bit about basically maybe what I think this was, what was going on, um, and give a, a few uh theories about what this was all about so the first one could have been um that i was a woman and that i was outspoken and you know but me being outspoken anybody else it just would have been you know them just being themselves but since it's me and this woman has a wedge with me she has a problem with me and i faced that before the second thing could have been, and I know this is disgusting to even think about, and I hate this stuff, but it could have been a light skin versus dark skin thing. I don't consider myself to be very light skin. I think I'm quite just brown toned, but um, she was on the darker skin side, and that exists, especially in the in the city I grew up in in Atlanta. This dark skin versus light skin thing, even if it's subconscious, I've seen it happen over and over again, and I think it's disgusting. Um, it could have been a simple insecurity, you know, that she wasn't as, um, she had no experience. I mean, that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. She had no experience as an executive director. And so it could have just been a question of insecurity. Um, I, I, I have considered narcissism. She seems like a narcissist, you know, like I guess the traits that I could give to that is she has a higher sense of herself. And she seems to have this air of superiority about her, like she thinks that she's better than other people. Um, for me, it seems like she really took some joy out of making me the villain and antagonizing me and driving me out. Um, she did the hovering thing that they talk about that, uh, that narcissists do. You know, after I'm gone, she comes back just to check and see, hey, you, can, can you do this? Or like, no, no, bitch. <laughs> um, so she could have been a narcissist. Um, but ultimately, I think it just comes down to bad boss. Bad boss is a bad boss is a bad boss. And at that point, you know, my mental and physical well-being was suffering. I was sick, you know, I was sick. I was eating crap basically to just work so 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 hard to give this woman what she wanted but it wasn't possible because what she wanted was just for me to leave um my mental well-being you know i have never felt so um alone i've never felt like you know not alone but felt like Someone was actively trying to make me feel isolated and alone. I've never felt something like that before. Always been a very self-confident person and uh, I still am to this day. And part of me leaving that situation was re-owning 
that about myself. Um, it's very important to believe in yourself. I'm just not sure that this woman believed in herself very much. And so since she didn't believe in herself, it was easier for her to trash me. Um, I think I will see the company suffer before it gets better. And they go through executive directors like paper towels. <laughs> so I don't know how long that's going to last. You know, I have an executive director who has no experience at all. But maybe she'll learn on the job. Who knows? Um, but... I had my peace and I got my peace with it and I got another contract like to replace that in 15 seconds you know like literally within the next couple of days so that further proved to me how advanced I am in my career how good I am at what I do and how people respond to my work ethic you know I really really pride myself in what I do um, I'm not the type of person who just, you know, slacks off on the job and still sends you the bill. That's not me. That's what I did. I ran for the hills and I have no regrets about it. My life is so much better now. Even though I was doing this child advocacy work that was so fulfilling for me, I'm doing it in my own ways now. I'm following certain movements through my own channels, you know, through my own efforts, through my church and things like that. And so I think that's okay. Yeah, I, 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 I walk away from this stronger than I was when I walked into it. And I would not change one single thing about it. As I said, not one thing. I would do the same thing. I would stick up for my scruples because people like this, they don't know well, sometimes they do know um, what they're doing to your reputation, to your career. You know, when somebody gaslights you and tries to make you out to be something that you're not, um, sometimes it's best to just cut those ties and say goodbye um, because they will bring no good to your life. And like I said, now I'm so I'm so much in a better place than I was. You know, like I feel like I'm me again. I feel like I had to sort of hide my confidence, hide my uh, intelligence around this woman and now I feel like I'm just free to be myself again so I'm I've lost about let's see wow um, 14 kilo so about 25 pounds and uh, I've been doing the paleo diet for about four months now um, I'm eating really well and you just feel better I'm going to the gym uh, I've got a great client. I got married. Uh, hopefully very soon we want to get a little puppy. It's just, you know, our business is growing. We started a business, as I mentioned. Our business is growing. It's just so many things are thriving. Oh, and not to mention you guys. You know, I'm, I have time and, you know, the spirit to come and actually do my vlog, you know, because before all of this negativity was just clouding me and I'm less anxious so you know it would really it would have really been against my moral code to just kiss this woman's ass and um keep a pretty bad paying job um but abandon my morals and my um Not only abandon my morals, but let lower myself down to something that I'm not. You know, I know that I have the experience and the competence in my domain. And nobody should make you try to be something that you're not, like an inexperienced, you know, incompetent dum-dum. Nobody should do that. Um, so, yeah, it's a lesson that you might have to learn over and over again. But all in all, I think in the end, it turned out better for me.